Welcome everybody. What a fun Friday. We're going to do a crash course in all the amendments in the United States Constitution. 27 amendments plus one because we're going to ask you at the end what's your favorite amendment to add onto the Constitution if you had an option for a 28th amendment. So to get started, we are going to look at some big questions in today's class. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Constitution Center, and I'll be here to get all of your questions to Jeff during this class. So ask lots of them, but hold on to your, we always say, hold on to your French fries in our house. Hold on to your French fries because we're going to move really quickly. Our top scholar today is Jeff Rosen, the President and CEO of the National Constitution Center. And Jeff, I'm going to start off right away. These are some big questions we're going to solve today. So how have constitutional amendments transformed the Constitution? How do we actually change the Constitution in the first place? How do you get an amendment passed? And then how do we understand these amendments in kind of groupings? Is there a way to group them together? And then students, this is your end question to you all. At the end, we're gonna say, what is your suggestion for the 28th Amendment? So Jeff, you ready to dive into Article 5 and figure out how do we change the Constitution? Sure. Um, how do we change the Constitution, of course, is Article 5. And we know that that uh, tells us that we can, uh, here's the great amendment process, and you remember it well, we can propose an amendment uh, either by two thirds of the members of both houses or two thirds of the states. And then it has to be ratified by three quarters of the states or by three quarters of the voters in special ratifying conventions. The big thought here is that it is ratification that gives the amendments the source of supreme law and allows that text to speak in the name of we the people. The proposal is just made by Congress or by a special convention convened on application of the states. Um, it can't speak for us until it's ratified. So that leads to the groupings. And I and we since we've got to get through all 27, why don't we begin with the obvious place, which is the Bill of Rights. Um, uh, and what a great group encouraged. Look at this excellent uh, taxonomy you have. And then we'll talk about the post-Reconstruction Amendments, which are so important, and then the Progressive Era, and then the Modern Era. You know, uh, as here's here's some here's a challenge for you, and I have it for myself. I can kind of do without too much trouble the first nineteen by heart. But getting the remaining eight, I need little mnemonics because they're less intuitive. So let's make sure we don't slight the uh, final amendments that were passed between 1933 and 1992. Okay, Curry, how do you want to talk about the first 12 amendments? So great question. So when I when I look at this big idea for this class, we think about the constitution of a charter of freedom, but this what you just walked us through with Article 5, that there is a way that the founding generation gave to future generations a, you know, a way to improve it, to edit it or amend it or completely change it. And so when I want to start with the first 10, I understand there's almost subgroupings in that first 10 as well. So the founding era, looking at those 10, but maybe we start off by kind of looking at those subgroupings and how they're put together. And then we'll dive into, of course, uh, what Joe Lee said and Mr. Madison said, the First Amendment may be above all others. These are great groupings. Curry, I, we haven't uh, talked about the, the <laughs> chart before, but it's really helpful. Great job. And um, thanks for grouping them together so well. So the First Amendment is in some ways the most important, but not because it's first. Here's a fun fact. We had a member of the Supreme Court, I won't say which one, who came to the National Constitution Center and saw one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, which we have at the Constitution Center. And he saw the original First Amendment was not the one dealing with freedom of conscience, but the one that said that there should be 30, uh, one, uh, one, inhabitant, one representative in Congress for every 30,000 inhabitants. If that had passed, there'd be 6,000 people in Congress today. The original Second Amendment wasn't the right to bear arms amendment. It was the one that said Congress can't raise its salary without an intervening election. That became the 27th Amendment in the 1990s. So our First Amendment was their third. There was no special reason that it came first, uh, except that it was the first one to be ratified. However, it's justly, oh, and, and the punchline of the story is the, the justice said, I didn't know that, um, that the First Amendment uh, wasn't first because it was the most important. Uh, we always say in our opinions, he said that it's the first because it's the most important, but I guess it's not. So um, that was uh, something we all learned. And I didn't know either until I saw the original Bill of Rights. 
But why is, and, and, free, and Curry, I love the fact that you use the word freedom of conscience, because that sums up the five freedoms of the First Amendment. Remember, the First Amendment is not just free speech, but it's also press, assembly, and freedom of religion, and petition. And I'm, my, since my screen is acting up, I'm not going to be able to call up as quickly as I want. The first sentence of Thomas Jefferson's uh, Virginia uh, Declaration of Religious Freedom, which he thought, along with the Declaration of Independence and the founding of the University of Virginia, was one of his three greatest achievements he wanted to put on his uh, tombstone, where it uh, inspires us today. And Jefferson said, essentially, that uh, the mind must be free and freedom of conscience is an unalienable right because the opinions of men and women being the result of the evidence proposed to their minds, we cannot alienate or surrender to others the power to control our thoughts because we cannot entirely control them ourselves. That's essentially what he said, although of course more eloquently. And that's why freedom of conscience is a natural right that comes from God or nature rather than government and everything flows from that. If my mind must be free to accept the propositions uh, presented by um, my reason, I can't give Curry the right to control it. I can't give government the right to control it. And I must also be free to speak and express my opinions unless they harm others in the sense of causing imminent lawless action. And I must be free to worship God or not according to the dictates of my conscience. And I must be free to assemble and to petition government on behalf of my uh, freely chosen opinions. So that's why it's also central. And if the whole purpose of government is to protect our freedom, our unalienable rights, uh, which include the right of conscience and the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all of which are uni uh, united with each other because the right to follow the dictates of my reason, which was the founders thought was the key to happiness, is itself an unalienable natural right and is key to personal and political happiness, um, that's why the government has to be constrained to protect the rights rather than to abridge them. Okay, so that's conscience, and we, we, get, we I won't promise not to spend that much time on all the amendments, but uh, let's. We let's have about six more to do. <laughs> we'll do it. So here, here's what I just learned, Curry, about the the uh, the, the um, second and third amendments. This was so interesting. You know, at the Constitution Center, we're preparing to put online a, a wonderful library of. Uh, documents from uh, throughout American history, the Founders Library and the Second Founders Library. And um, it'll be so inspiring to be able to read the primary texts. So we're trying to pick which documents to put. And I uh, read John Hancock on the Boston Massacre, which I think we're going to put online. And Hancock said in discussing the Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre and the, and the American Revolution, that the right of citizens to organize themselves as militias was crucial to protect liberty against British tyranny. So that language about a well-regulated militia came from Hancock, and it also came from the revolutionary era state constitutions. And if you go to the interactive constitution, you'll see that um, 11 out of the original 13 states talked about the right of militias to organize themselves because they were so afraid of um, now the newly created federal government coming and threatening citizens' liberties. So that was the central purpose and the interactive constitution joint explainer confirms that to essentially limit the power of a totalizing tyrannical federal government to, to come take away the people's liberties or to literally invade their homes and to conscript people into government service in ways that threaten their liberty. And that's why the second and third amendment are so important. And uh, the third amendment, which says that soldiers can't be quartered in any house without consent, um, even in times of war, except in a manner to be prescribed by law, are both ways of limiting the scope of a totalizing big brother state. Favorite amendments, this is totally geeky, but in law school, um, during my first weeks, I put the third amendment on my answering machine. <laughs> in those days, we, we had answering machines then, and I thought it was just kind of cool. Like, what? <laughs> what? I'm sure that there are folks out there who are similarly geeky and would, if we still had answering machines, I don't know, you can put it on your TikTok or something like that. But it's, yeah, I'm going to have to put your, put your favorite amendment somewhere. Okay, okay. let's keep going. <laughs> there, I surprised you with that We're one. We're going to use 
fifth twice. So we, I, we put fifth with privacy and property, but then we put fifth with um, the rights of the accused. So you're going to see fifth kind of straddle these next two groups. Absolutely. Um, privacy and property is a good way to put it. Oh, the fourth. Yes. As uh, David Olson said, near to my heart, I can't have favorites, but you know, it has a special place. And it is the most explicit constitutional protection for the right to privacy. Roe v. Wade, of course, uh, and, and the uh, autonomy decisions talk about a right to privacy and rooted in the liberty clause of the 14th Amendment. But the Fourth Amendment is the most explicit textual warrant, and it has to do with the privacy of people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. And of course, the big question, we just did the best podcast on this. Uh, yesterday, we recorded it. It just published uh, this morning. So check it out. It's about the future of the Fourth Amendment. It's with Jeff Fisher, who just argued the Lang case before the Supreme Court last week. And Jeff Fisher and uh, Donald Dribbs talk about the need to translate the amendment so it protects uh, our digital effects against government searches in an age when they're not stored in the home. And then and in a couple of weeks, we have an entire week on the Fourth Amendment so we can dive down a lot deeper. Now the Fifth Amendment. So if we're talking about the privacy protections, we privacy and property, we see a bunch of, um, yeah, you're helping me out with the cursor. It certainly says that private property can't be taken for public use. And remember, James Madison says in the Federalist Papers that, that the protection of private property is the primary purpose of government. He's getting that from John Locke. And um, it was central to the liberties that the framers thought had to be protected, because when we mix our labor with um, the earth or with uh, and create property, then that is... Uh, it's an unalienable right that can't be uh, deprived without due process of law. That's why you need to have just compensation if you take away private property without public use. But there also are um, privacy protections. And if we had time, I'd ask you to identify what language you think protects privacy here, but I'm just going to jump in and say the prohibition on compelling people in a criminal case to be a witness against themselves protects mental privacy. It protects freedom of conscience, doesn't it? I can't be compelled to confess my crimes or to wrongly say that I've done something that I haven't done. I can't be put under oath and face the penalty of either a perjury or eternal damnation if I think that I'm going to go to, uh, uh, to, 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 to if I'll be damned uh, to eternal damnation if I lie, as the, as, as the framers believed and, and, and um, uh, some people believe today. So that protects a zone of mental privacy against state coercion and it's absolutely crucial. Okay, let's keep going. We like that, we thought that was a good one. <laughs> okay, so um, looking at fair process. So looking again at the fifth amendment and then moving on to the sixth, seventh and eighth. Great, go, go back to the slide because you kind of summed them up. Well, you summed them up so well. So friends, when I teach at GW Law School, I teach uh, constitutional law and criminal procedure. And criminal procedure is so much fun to teach because it's basically constitutional criminal law. You know it from the police shows um, that you watch as well as you know how crucial these fair process rights are. The right to trial by jury, the right to confront your accusers, which you have a right to do in person, the right to a lawyer if you can't afford one, if you're accused of a serious crime, uh, and of course, the right not to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. All are crucial rights, but here's one big thing that is not intuitive. Very few trials go to jury. The, the jury trial is an atavism that applies to a tiny percentage of all the criminal cases in the U.S., because of plea bargaining and because um, the, the state has so much uh, coercive pressure to basically say, unless you take this deal and plead guilty and forsake your right to jury trial, then we're, you run the risk of getting a much higher sentence. So for that reason, these, these rights are very important in theory, but few people get to exercise them. There, it's so, mu so many rights kick in in a, in a trial that you don't have in a civil proceeding or in an immigration proceeding or in a deportation proceeding. The Supreme Court has just decided an important case involving the rights of non-citizens. They don't have the same rights that someone does if they are accused in a, a criminal trial and, and actually uh, go to trial. But it is important to realize that not that many cases go to trial. Okay, let's go. Six. 
Well, we talked about a lot of these rights, and here we're just dig digging in. The Seventh, the Seventh Amendment doesn't get a lot of love. Um, trial lawyers love it, um, uh, but it's one of the few places. If you really want to geek out, and there are a couple others, and I can ask you to for extra credit to identify them. Where in the Constitution are particular amounts of money identified? And this is one of them in the Seventh Amendment. That when the value in controversy exceeds twenty dollars, that was a lot of money back then. Obviously, uh, less now then you have a right to um, a civil jury trial according to the rules of common law. Do you wanna to touch Eighth Amendment just for a minute because it is such a kind of a contemporary conversation as well. Crucial, important, excessive bail not required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And it's the last phrase that's much debated and those who argue that the death penalty is uh, unconstitutional, say that it's a form of cruel and unusual punishment. Those who say it's not, and that represents a majority of the Supreme Court, say uh, a punishment can't be cruel if it's not unusual. And all states at the time of the founding had the death penalty. And even today, since as long as most states have it, as judged in their state constitutions, it can't be unusual. And as for cruelty, you take even Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia said you could look to evolving standards but you'd look to state constitutions to see what kind of punishments they thought were cruel and unusual. Interestingly, Justice Scalia recanted a view. He once had said he was a faint hearted originalist because flogging that brutal whipping of people, a completely brutal corporal punishment, he thought might be considered cruel and unusual today, even though it wasn't at the time of the framing. But right before he passed away in a really interesting interview in New York Magazine, which you guys can check out because it's so vivid, he said, no, I was, I shouldn't have wimped out flogging. I would think it's terrible today, but I don't think it's unconstitutional. Okay. Fascinating. Okay, the next grouping, um, the ninth and 10th, which I refer to as the catch-all amendments, but really look at this idea of ensuring popular sovereignty of the individual and the state. Yes, now in that interview, Justice Scalia said the ninth amendment didn't really mean anything. And because no one understood what it meant, it shouldn't be taken seriously. I, I, with great respect to the late justice, that's not consistent with the original understanding of the framers. This language is precise. Madison chose it to answer the objection that a bill of rights was unnecessary or dangerous. Unnecessary because the constitution itself was a bill of rights that constrained Congress's power and didn't give it the authority to infringe free speech. And dangerous because Madison said, people might wrongly assume that if a right isn't written down, it's not protected. And because our natural rights, which come from God or nature and not from government, are so sweeping, so capacious, so, so uh, expansive in their scope, it would be wrong to assume that the framers were able to enumerate all of our natural rights. So what the one thing the Ninth Amendment does is it's, it's a rule of construction. It says, don't do that. Don't do what, I, what Madison just worried about. Don't assume that if a right isn't written down, it's not protected. What the Ninth Amendment doesn't do is give us a methodology of interpretation that tells us how to identify the unenumerated rights or rights that aren't written down that are protected. And that's where all of the action in constitutional law is. That's the debate between originalists and living constitutionalists and pragmatists and democratic constitutionalists and all the interesting questions of methodology. There's another interesting word, just to go back one sec, retained by the people, that's Lockean um, and also Scottish Enlightenment natural law theory. When we move from the state of nature to civil society, we alienate or surrender to the government certain rights in order to ensure greater security of the rights we've retained. So that it's, isn't that interesting? In the course of giving the government temporary authority to have a monopoly of power to punish murder and crimes, for example, we retain certain rights, like our rights of conscience, just because the government can punish crimes doesn't mean it can infringe my freedom of thought. Now we see the connection between the Ninth and Tenth Amendments because if a power isn't delegated to the United States um, and the power also isn't uh, forbidden uh, to Congress, uh, by, uh, then it's reserved to the states or to the people. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it. Uh, the United States to the states are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Um, so the idea is that we, the people, collect, just as we, the people, as individuals, reserve or retain individual natural rights, so we, the people, collectively 
uh, reserve or retain the powers that we haven't delegated. And yes. that's why there's a general, sorry, last thought, a general police power that the states have um, to punish. In the old days, it was health, safety, and morals, although the ability to punish morals has been constrained by recent Supreme Court opinions like the Obergefell and um, Lawrence in Texas decision, um, but generally the states have much broader powers to regulate than Congress does. And there's two more in the founding era that not a part of the Bill of Rights, the 11th and 12th. So the 11th is a really interesting example of a text that the Supreme Court has completely ignored. Um, in a Supreme Court case around the time of the framing, uh, the Marshall Court recognized um, the ability of a citizen uh, of one state to sue a citizen of another state. And Congress didn't like that because uh, it thought that states have some power of sovereign immunity in their residual capacity as, as state sovereign. So it passed this amendment saying um, one citizen of the United States can't sue um, a citizen of another state. But the Supreme Court interpreted that much more broadly than the language of the 11th Amendment to say that states can never be sued in certain circumstances, either by their own citizens or by other citizens. So in other words, it abstracted from this pretty narrow prohibition on one citizen uh, suing an, uh, another state to say that the states can't be sued under any circumstances. And that's just atextual and it's not consistent with the original understanding. The 12th Amendment, boy, that one is complicated. We talked a lot about that when we talked about the Electoral College, but you remember it. And remember, it was a result of the, the, the mess that resulted from the election of 1800 when the electors tied between Jefferson and uh, Burr, who were both on the same ticket. And in order to ensure that the president and vice presidential candidates of the same party never tied again, they passed the 11th Amendment, ensuring that that couldn't happen. And if we consider some of the amendments, like maybe the 12th, we consider they are amending or editing or like kind of clarifying the constitution. The next three are big major changes to the structural constitution. When we look at the reconstruction amendments with the 13th, 14th and 15th. Um, so this is why we group them together to look at the end of the civil war and the big changes with these three amendments. So run us through there really quickly. We have a lot more to go through. <laughs> we'll do it. Friends, broadly, you understand why the Reconstruction period is called by some the second founding because it fulfilled the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all men and women are created equal. That promise was thwarted by the original constitution which allowed the continued existence of slavery. And it took the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments um, and the civil war itself to begin to make the promise a reality. That's the big picture of course. And then of course, we also know that the Reconstruction Amendments were thwarted themselves by the Supreme Court after the Civil War and by redemption, that brutal period of terror where African-Americans were denied the rights that the Reconstruction Amendments promised them and all citizens and all persons under in, in some circumstances. And that once again, it took um, activism from the ground up. That's the way Justice Ginsburg always put it the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement um, and other movements on behalf of previously excluded people to make the promise a uh, reality. So 13th end slavery, 14th puts the promise of equality into the constitution. And as Ryan's favorite selective incorporation begins here, and that that was his favorite. <laughs> well, it does the 14th is a lot more than that, but it's- Yeah, a, I know, I'm just trying to move that. along. <laughs> and 15th, um, promises that you cannot be denied the right to vote for um, based on race. And what I th found fascinating about 15, and we'll get to 19 and to 26, that the language is almost the same. So I pointed out here as we kind of move forward in time to the progressive era. So as we look at the progressive era, we're looking at amendments 16 through 19. And Jeff, feel free to do 18 and 21 together because they really do fit so nicely together. Great. Well, um... 16 reversed a Supreme Court decision, the Pollock decision, five to four decision over a dramatic dissenting opinion by Justice John Marshall Harlan, the great dissenter. Uh, suffice it to say that the Pollock decision was not consistent with the original understanding of Alexander Hamilton, but said that uh, the federal government had no power to create an unapportioned income tax. Can you imagine, like it's, this decision got 
far more attention than any other decision of his age. And that's why it was reversed by a constitutional amendment um, endorsed by both parties that said that Congress can uh, lay and collect unapportioned taxes. The 17th is of a really important structural amendment that comes that, remember the original constitution says that senators are chosen by state legislators in the progressive era, people thought that doesn't make any sense. All these corrupt legislators are choosing their cronies. We should have direct popular election of senators. This election, this amendment uh, remains contested today. And there are some libertarian scholars and citizens and some conservatives uh, as well who think that the election by legislators is an important protection of federalism and state sovereignty. And they say they want to go back to um, non-direct election of uh, senators. Uh, unlikely to pass, but an interesting debate. The 18th prohibition, what an interesting story this is. Um, both that the 18th was passed and that so quickly um, it was repealed. Um, and it just shows how quickly um, public opinion can shift uh, in just the space of a few years. You can have an amendment to the constitution and then um, it can be repealed. Uh, and there's a lot to say about prohibition. We had a great exhibit on prohibition at the Constitution Center a while ago, which uh, made clear how an overreach in the scope of prohibition and it, in its enforcement turned the tide against prohibition and led to its repeal in the 21st Amendment. And I'm sorry I didn't point this out earlier, but we had artists do um, icons for every single amendment. This one cracks me up the most. Um, <laughs> <but> I <should've... laughs> yeah, like, oh my God, I'm sorry, I meant to point that. They're all it's great. So I just love the way, uh, like you can have your students do this as an activity, take the amendment, break it down, understand it, and then create art to show what it means. Um, it's just a different way of like showing their brilliance. Um, the 19th amendment, a lot of people on this group were like, I love the 19th amendment. It's my favorite one. So Jeff, tell us a little bit more about this one. Well, just go, uh, Curry, don't we, I think next week, we're going to yes. launch our online exhibit on the 19th Amendment, because at the Constitution Center just last year, we opened the most inspiring exhibit on the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And we have a great online link, which we'll be able to post um, as soon as I, I've got to read the final text. So you reminded me about my homework for this. this and next week's to classes. Go. All of next week's classes are the 19th Amendment and Martha Jones is going to join us next Friday. So we've got a bang week coming up. <laughs> it's great. So important that uh, at last women were uh, granted the rights promised by the Declaration of Independence and claimed by heroic women from the time of the founding on. Uh, it took a long time, but it happened in the 19th Amendment. Um, Maureen, can't wait to see it. It's so beautiful. I can't, can't wait for you to see it either. All right. Now we come to the modern era. It's and, modern ish, just to be transparent. <laughs> well, it's modern enough because it's it's the last amendments we have. <laughs> um, I won't. I don't know if I'll give you my mnemonics. Remembering that the twenty second is the two term presidency, th there was this really long period between the election and inauguration. The election in November and the inauguration in March. So in the twenty second amendment, we put the inauguration on January twentieth. You know that turns out to be a pretty significant. Um, choice, as we saw, because January 20th was a hard deadline for which Congress and everyone has to resolve all electoral disputes. Some are saying now it's too long and inauguration should be sooner after November. So there's not such a long period, but that's the 22nd Amendment. Many, the 21st, sorry, many of these amendments, the ones we're going to be doing, really have to do with voting rights and the expansion of the franchise and also the administration of elections. So that tends to be um, an interesting pattern that we see in the modern era. The, the um, 21st, we talked about real prohibition, but the next one, the 22nd, a two-term limit on the presidency. Franklin Roosevelt is elected to four terms, although he... Um, dies at the beginning of his um, fourth term. And uh, Congress decides they don't want another four-term president and they pass the 22nd Amendment, which limits presidents to two terms. Um, so in David Kendrick's class, one of his students just asked, was that in the works before FDR or was it because of FDR? And then did they, I always want to know, did they pick 10 years because they wanted to make sure Truman couldn't make it past 10? Um, just kind of some questions around that one. <laughs> Um, 
I believe, and I don't want to be overconfident here, I would have to go to the interactive constitution to answer those questions, and any of you can do that to find out, but I believe that the amendment was not considered before FDR, that it was indeed a response to FDR, and 10 years, I think, was just so that it didn't affect anyone who was running at the time, but, uh, but there may be a more specific answer. Check the interactive constitution. 23rd. Um, if you got to remember if you, for your mnemonics, because I want you, I'm going to try to test myself after the class, but 22, two terms, maybe think of it that way. 23, the District of Columbia um, gets electors, uh, basically just um, two. You get one, oh, sorry, three, the whole number of senators. So if the DC were a state where some people say it should be and others say it shouldn't be, um, you'd get two senators plus one representative, which there's a non-voting representative. So you'd get three. Um, and that's how many electors DC gets. 24. Oh, wait, go, go back. Wait, what a great mnemonic, Curry. Oh, I was just saying what you said. <laughs> 23 but, gets three. No, but, but I hadn't thought of that. Now, <laughs> now we just got our mnemonic. Hey, friends, we're, we're doing it. Um, tw 22 is two presidential terms. 23 um, DC gets three. That, thank you. Rhyming. I don't know if that works. I think that's pretty great. I, and Cray made it up. I didn't even realize I was doing it. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, 24, sorry. I got 24. Um, you can't have a poll tax. What is a poll tax? It sounds like a tax that you pay at the polls. Actually, poll means head. It's an ancient, an old English word for head. Basically, uh, in the colonial era and the early founding era, you had to pay a tax because people thought that only people with property should be able to uh, vote because they were the ones who had the biggest investment literally in the community. Later, poll taxes were used in discriminatory ways to disenfranchise African-Americans who'd been granted uh, or promised the right to vote, including by their Voting Rights Act of 64. And um, here, uh, the amendment says you can't have poll taxes to disenfranchise people for discriminatory or other reasons. The Supreme Court, interestingly, had reached a similar conclusion. So this is a case where both the court and the amendment process converged to the same result. How, how are we going to remember poll taxes in 24? I uh, can't... Let me think about it while you do 25. Okay. <laughs> and teachers, if you have any good mnemonic devices for 24, um, not stuck at the door, I don't know. I'm coming up with bad ones now. Go to 25. <laughs> Wait, oh, Kimberly is coming up. Great. You guys are coming up with great mnemonics. 25 in line to succeed the president. Two, four, two, poor to vote. Nice. Two, four, two. Oh, four. I like that. Two, four, pay no more. I two, like that. Two, four, pay no more. Love Alan it. Stout, you're winning on that one. I like anything that rhymes. <laughs> two, four, two, poor to vote. Two, four, pay no more. Great. 25th, we heard a lot about it um, recently. I did. You remember, friends, our the last uh, deputy attorney general who became acting attorney general had the same name as me, Jeffrey Rosen. So everyone thought I was the deputy attorney general. So people are tweeting at me every day, invoke the 25th Amendment. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to say it's not it's the other Jeffrey Rosen. I don't have any power to do that. But that's the one that provides what happens if the president becomes incapacitated. Um, and it's section four, that's the most controversial provision. And um, despite calls on Twitter, uh, neither the attorney general nor the vice president, who really is the one who triggers that whole process, invoked the 25th amendment uh, uh, after the election. Okay, so the fastest amendment, the 26th amendment. This is relevant to all of you friends. Um, once you're 18, you are allowed to vote. And um, that important enfranchisement of young people was crucial in expanding the franchise. Uh, a mnemonic for 26, obviously it's 18, not 26 that you wrote. So you guys go, go for it to the teachers. Time. I'm going to turn it back to Kimberly and, and um, Alan, see if you come up with a good one. Come so 26th Amendment, I always find fascinating because this is a response to the Vietnam War and that you were 18 to go to war, but not to vote. And this is a really quick turnaround of a constitutional amendment, the fastest. And then we go to the longest on the books. The 27th is such a great story because it was a, student, a college student who got a bad grade on a term paper when he argued, hey, most states have actually ratified the 27th Amendment, which was the original Second Amendment. Remember, just to bring the class full circle, 
he said, if just a few more states ratify, it should be part of the constitution. And his teacher thought that's a, just didn't take it seriously and gave him a bad grade. He thought, I don't agree with that. He began to argue and write more about this. He convinced a few other states to ratify. And as a result of his efforts, the 27th Amendment uh, was certified as a valid part of the Constitution by the Archivist of the United States and incorporated into the Constitution. So it's a very inspiring example of the fact that you, students, can have a tremendous difference in being a part of constitutional change and also always follow the dictates of your reason and conscience. If a constitutional argument seems to you valid, insist on it and argue for it and, and make it vigorously and you may persuade the entire uh, world that you are correct. Um, and so as we come C full minus circle- in, Linda, Linda Frita, C minus in class and after it passed, he, uh, I'm, I'm just getting uh, in the chat. Um, Uh, well, uh, uh, yes, after it passes, great was changed. So glad she reminded us of that, Linda. Thank you so much. And it's good, teachers, Madison reminds us, um, if, if, if we're wrong, we should have the uh, grace and courage and uh, uh, correctness to admit that. And it was great that his grade was properly changed. Yeah, and that's what great about a teacher, even years later, is still teaching all of us how to say, you know what, you're right, and I'm going to fix that grade. So I loved it. So what a great class, what a fun uh, crash course in this. We're, we're all going to be thinking of mnemonic devices all weekend long for the 26 and how we can come up with those. Teachers, if you think of those, and students, if you think of those, send them our way. I will add that to the PowerPoint too. Warren pointed out our PowerPoint online has all the dates with each amendment too. So if you go to that when I shared the link, you'll be able to get the dates associated sit with it and you won't have to look that up. But I love the new pneumonic device, share them and we'll put them on our website. Brilliant ideas out there, 24, um, vote no, now I'm, now I'm forgetting it, but I'll, I'll download the chat. <laughs> but then um, Lainey notes, I went nine minutes and 54 seconds over, not too bad, but it was 137. So maybe we'll call it uh, 10 minutes, but appropriate enough for 27 amendments. But friends, I just, just for fun, no one's gonna test you except yourselves, but I want you to test yourself. Try to recite in your minds this weekend, all 27 amendments. First, conscience. Second, right to bear arms. Third, no soldiers in the house and so forth. And just do it, see if you can do it all the way through to 27. And if you do, you will have uh, inspired yourselves to have complete um, uh, mastery over these wonderful amendments, which do so much to guarantee our freedoms.